So, of course, I invited Laura because I happen to know she's a gardener, <laughs> but she is also the volunteer coordinator for the Horticultural Society. I did learn that Laura is a gardener and has quite a garden, and I usually ask my guests to bring their favorite garden tool. So let's see what your favorite garden tool is. Yes, well, it's actually two that I use in combination. And as you can see, they're brand new because I've worn out my tools. And so it was um, my birthday last month. And so this is the first time it's actually come out. But yes, kneeling pad. This is so important and I don't go anywhere in uh, the garden without it because uh, we need to save our knees and this is something that I use all the time of course my well-worn one is still in my shed and then uh, in combination with the dandelion puller um, these go hand in hand with me all the time so it is so useful because um, you know I do have in my garden I have a combination of a dry rock garden as well as um, mulch you know when you kneel on the mulch you get it right in the knees so this is something that I always am kneeling on and then of course um, now my old my older dandelion pullers are being gifted to my kids <laughs> and so now they each have one and my husband has a couple as well so the the new one goes to mom I haven't actually used it yet so with that my favorite tools well I have I have a favorite dandelion weeder as you can see mine's a little um, well used and it has a bend in it because in the first two months we lived in our house I discovered the hard way that my house was built on a rock bed and I sho shoved it in to get the dandelion that was living there and I pulled back and I got this but no dandelion no. <laughs> and I swear that dandelion just moves itself around my garden <laughs> And when I had my raised vegetable garden built, it just moved into the corner between the paving and the garden. And every year I dig it out and tell, tell them, Clive, this is it. We are done. And don't ask me why I named them Clive. I have no idea. But you do develop your favorites. And I discovered this curve is quite useful. Hence oh, yeah, the reason so the new ones yeah. have, a, I designed something new. Who yeah. knew? <laughs> So it is, and I saw someone walk in here with my other favorite oh, kneeler. Yes, yes, I saw oh, yeah. too. Yeah. The seat, by the way. <laughs> it what? It works great as a seat. Oh, sure it does. I take one to the dog trials, and I sit on it, and I get envy from a lot of people because it. Or sit. <laughs> yes, and that's what I like about it. You can kneel on it or sit on it, great. and it's so really you good. Can push yourself I was just going to say, and you can get yourself up again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lee Valley. Yeah. Yeah, I came home from England with one, and I loved it and loved it, and it was doing really well. But I left it out over the winter, and oh. it was plastic, and English plastic, and North American weather no. doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah. I, I just have to say though, Laura, so what's in your garden you've got? So I have quite a bit of, uh, well, I like to test things out every year yes. so to see, but you know, so I have a combination of a raised garden bed that I do square foot gardening in and I did uh, lasagna layering in it as a, as a test this, oh. this year. And so it turned out quite well, but um, you know, my nemesis, squirrels. <laughs> Uh, we have quite a few squirrels in, in there and um, on the uh, surrounding the raised garden bed I also have some um, garden beds where I have just made this year. They weren't as successful as I would have liked. Um, a lot of my zucchini and my patapan, I got nothing but male flowers. Oh, yeah. Nothing but male flowers and so it was nice to see that pop of color but for the wrong reason I would have well you could have eat them I you know what I should have <laughs> you know plucked them and then you know done the stuffed and yeah. and deep fried them but um yeah they definitely all male flowers oh my goodness this year but I've so. heard that a lot because my mm -hmm. squash are sitting out I moved them out front because I thought they got more sun there mm. 
and mine, I only have two patty pans. I do have three butternuts, so I'm quite excited about those. But the zucchini, my neighbor grew zucchini this year, and the other day, because she has it up on her deck, <laughs> I looked and hanging over the edge of the deck, I said, Ange, have you looked over the edge of your deck? And she goes, no. She had a zucchini this long just hanging off the plant on that side. <laughs> I said, you're going to get a year's worth of zucchini bread out of that. Anyway, she took it. And when you harvest any squash crop or anything like that, don't cut it off at the squash. Cut out, leave at least two inches of stem. Uh, yeah, that keeps them and holds them and they ripen better and they also don't go hard. My butternut squash last year, I had quite a good crop and I <laughs> forgot I had one in, in the cupboard and found it in March. <laughs> and it was fine. It was really good. <laughs> That's so... Yeah, she's growing it on a container. She made her husband move the barbecue <laughs> and, and it's sitting in this window box and now they're going to redo their whole deck and put planters around it and the barbecue has to move somewhere else Away. there. <laughs> Away. But yeah, she's growing it in containers and they're about this deep, about eight inches deep. Bobby did come to me, her husband, and say, how deep should I build these? I said, at least eight inches. So she did that, and then I said, and whatever you do, you only put three in this box. Well, they're fabulous, and they've produced and produced. I even got one for some zucchini bread, so mm. I'm quite excited about that. It's, it's really fun to work with, and, you know, you can't help but do that. But what have you got in your rock garden? So I, it's a, a yearly progress. I take out more lawn every year, and so when the snow timber happened a few yes. years back that we had an amur cherry tree yes. that really got hit and basically it was actually a city tree as well and they came to assess it and they ended up um, having to pull it and so in place of that i have put a center focal point of a romeo cherry tree so the sour oh. cherry tree which was fabulous this year uh, we beat the squirrels to harvesting the the evidence. and the birds and the oh birds my goodness the robins think you only plant a cherry tree oh, for them I know. so much for <laughs> i know and so i actually didn't net the cherry tree this year oh. so it is only um it's about five to seven years old uh so i you know it's about six feet tall and we were able to still harvest the the cherries on it without okay. having to net it and they were fabulous we were um my kids my kids are eight and eleven so they love to just help harvest and then be able to um, enjoy what I bake with the cherries, cherries. Oh. afterwards and um, I am soaking some of the cherries in um, an adult beverage in my <laughs> in my fridge right now so that's you know well I'll have some cherry syrup after oh, but nice. yeah so my um, I have an Asian inspired front rock garden Ah. And every year, little by little, I do take out some of the um, grass. Yes. And I'm turning it into a dry creek bed. And okay. one of the additions that I hope to have fully installed by the end of this year is um, a little garden bridge uh, ah. to add into that. I I have um, you know a little bamboo f bamboo fence that goes around it, ah. and so a lot of ornamentals. And and so my hope is after I do get rid of that is I'm going to be putting in some more native perennial plants around where the the bridge is going to go so that's Very that's good. what I like and so when know. are you going to publish some pictures oh for gosh. us to put on our art in an you article know. Deb did you take notes there we need an article on this <laughs> I um, it, it's my goal actually to actually open my garden in, oh. in f five years okay hold me to it five years three, five years three you heard five. that did everybody take notes <laughs> i hope to um because i do live in the northwest as well and so to be able to have an open garden in the northwest with yes you know and i and i love doing the asian theme um well, of course incorporating part of my heritage as well so. i was just going to say it's uh, a heritage thing that's what i enjoy and then yeah. i progress photos yes 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 we had 
Um, the previous owners of our house had a very, very large wagon wheel oh, as yes. the front, but it didn't speak to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> and those wagon wheels are heavy. Yeah, very, there's a reason they held those wagons up. <laughs> very heavy, and and so they kind of half buried it as yeah. a focal point on the corner of our house. But um, we had it for a couple of years. But then, as soon as that snow timber ha happened, that whole the the cherry tree and the the wagon wheel kind of evolved. deteriorated and evolved. 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 <laughs> well, a garden is yes. just an yeah. evolution of our changing styles, our changing thought process. Um, you know, more and yes. more we find ourselves just changing what kind of labor. Like yeah. your chosen cherry were s selected by the yes. breeders because they didn't require a ladder to pick them. Yes. So, and they have a natural canopy to them so that you can hand pick them. You don't have to get on a step stool and pick them. Exactly, so and my kids exactly they and pick. they can pick and they can do that and that to me is part and parcel of it i mean if any of i mean i'm sure that you have all visited orchards and seen how they prune the apple trees down into a big umbrella because that eases how much picking they can do and how they do it because otherwise you know have you ever seen one of those fruit picking baskets mm -hmm. tedious <laughs> oh, but yes. they do a job and they use that but mostly in the orchards they're doing it for time and efficiency and saving themselves a yeah. bit of money so that pruning and it actually opens the canopy up so that they don't get fruit rot and they don't get insects so it's it's all part of that evolution of it and I I think it's fascinating to watch and to see how they grow I Every once in a while, I find myself looking. I had an apple tree. I lost it to apple scab, and I had spent four or five years canopying it and turning it into an. It's gone this year because of the oh. scab. I couldn't win, and I miss it. <laughs> so now I'm looking at. Now what am I going to do? Well, I got a brand new fence this year. Brand new fence. Oh, it's so exciting! It doesn't fall down when the wind blows. <laughs> So I'm going to get a new apple tree, but I'm going to espalier it. Oh, I'm going to take nice. it up near the fence and espalier it. And I can hardly wait. Um, my lovely neighbor, Bob, built it, and I got him to put a second bracing board on it, and I'm going to just do screw eyes and run it along. So if you find me wandering in garden centers, I'm searching for my new baby. Oh. <laughs> so. You know, to me, this time of year is about go forward planting, looking at what we can grow. And, you know, I'm glad you brought your weeder because this is weed season. Yeah. This is when we really, really work at it and, and try to get as much value out of what we can get out of the ground right now. And there are all sorts of new seedling dandelions, and they're easier to dig than in the springtime because in the springtime, they put out their, their side roots. At this time of year, they're just putting a seedling root down and it's just going straight down. So you just get in there and take it up. Same thing, the seedling thistles are out. Yeah. I noticed them. So getting them and getting them out is really important right now. Mm -hmm. And everyone says to me, oh, September, everything's done. Nuh-uh, <laughs> nuh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Sure, absolutely. absolutely. That's what we're here for. So I have a few of the aspects set ahead in my front yard between me and my neighbor that has got to be about seven or eight feet high and it's impossible to trim properly now. Um, the previous owners of the house didn't trim it. Uh, it well, they must have sporadically, but so it's got. Um, Sort of length this long, half uh, in the middle section where there's no branching. Yeah, the darkness choked it there. out. And then the crown where I've been at it is all it's very thick, and when I go with my cutter, it just it's just so thick wood that I can't. And I'm done. Mm. So this thing has to be. I was going to cut it right down. 
but I would like some instruction about when. I yeah. have thinned it over the years and pulled out all the dead stuff. I, I bury myself in the hedge for a day every year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get all the dead wood out. Uh, so I've got new growth coming from the bottom. Yes, you do. So what do I do to get this thing under control? And if I can't, I'm, I'm really in the mode that if it won't behave, I'm going to pull it out. There is one section of it that gives you quite a bit of privacy on our front patio. And I'm feeling a bit mm, mm -hmm. about taking that right down. So I, uh, can you give me some instructions and timelines? Well, it, it, right now is a really good time to take Cotoneaster down. Mm -hmm. And really and truly, because it's got the bald spot in the middle and all the growth on the outside is choking out light, taking it down right now will, for one thing, you won't get the Cotoneaster scale if you do it now. Yeah. You won't get that problem. However, I am going to say to you, once you do take it down, spray it with dormant spray so that you don't attract any random uh, scale flying around trying to find a new home. So that's one of the things. But getting that center growth out, especially when the trunks get about two to three inches, they're not meant to be like that. In their natural state, they grow as a ferny looking shrub and they should never be allowed to get big. So you've got two choices. You can take it right to the ground with just leaving the new growth. But you're also going to have to get right in it and those big thick trunks that are left, you have to get right in with a good saw and take it down. To the ground. To the ground. Because I see my neighbor leave this much. Yes. And it, it'll, it'll be fine, but wherever there's the bigger trunks, to the, ground. to the ground, or it won't fill in nicely, it won't be tidy. I mean, the best example I can give you is the Carragana hedge over along over here. If you go and look at it, it naturally grows up like a vase. So it is an easy hedge to have, except that the root systems on it are almost as big as a spruce tree, so they'll just take over. But the Catoni Aster maintains quite a tidy root, but it's that big, strong, thick trunk, which will make it a it will um, evolve into, see, they're from their Chinese tree. And in China, they grow them up as big trees and they're valued for their big fancy canopy. And that's what makes them. So taking out the big thick stunk, stunk trunk right down in is the only way. But you really and truly, I would get someone with a chainsaw and take it down, truly. How old is it? Oh, 25, 30? No yeah. How old's the house? It was built in 67. Okay. My neighbor's got this idea about this tidy, eight foot, beautifully trimmed box. Tent. Well, I, I, I don't want that anyway. It's way too much. It's yes. Too yeah. And, and really and truly, where they really look great is when they're kept around four to five feet. Okay. And that's when they look really great. By taking them down in the fall, you'll in trigger spring growth. Make sure that once the big trunks are, top dress it with compost. Get some good soil going on in there and go in there with an aerator or something and aerate around those roots. And then it will start to put out new babies and start to grow properly. The new babies that have grown that I've managed to get going and are still leave. thin and about yay long, can I leave? Them? Yes, I was just going to say, Leave them. However, who's your chainsaw master? Who are you going to get to do this? I think it'll be me with the loppers. Okay. With loppers, you have to be really careful. You have to make sure they stay sharp. Because if you take them and tear, yeah, clean, clean, straight cut, no angles, straight cuts on those big trunks. Okay. All right. And I don't have to wait for a frost or anything. No. You can start now. They're, they're shutting down. And I mean, if you were to go over and shake, they took down all the caraganas here. But if you look on the hillside, you can see they're starting to sprout. They've cleaned out a lot of the big trunks and they're looking really good. But this hillside's a really good example of spaced out caraganas. Oh, this is a, a Catoniaster. Catoniaster, I'm sorry, I'm doing care. Those are Catoniasters, that's caragan. Yeah. 
Sorry, I. It's why I mix up. <laughs> yeah, and and be brave and and don't. <laughs> be brave and and make sure you keep those loppers sharpened. Um, I carry around, as a rule, I carry around a sharpener, and especially for small beaked types of pruners. Yes, you can. Same time, of year. Same time of year and everything, but get in there and make sure that when you're cutting, you sharpen this side of it. These are going to be my most sharpened pruners ever. <laughs> and then the other part of it is, is this is the time of year when these should be clean and looked after because you're going to do a lot of cutting back and the sharper your tool and the stronger it is, the more cutting back you can do. I mean, I go in and clean up my perennials with my little fiskers, and I cut right down and in, but my hand gets really tired, but I like them because they're just the right shape. Just don't put them in your back pocket yeah. and sit down. And sit down. And sit down, because <laughs> it hurts. For the hedge, does it better to have the curve? I don't know the difference between a curve. A curve. The, the, it's better to work with something like this. Yeah, for the heavier wood. I um, I don't know if I brought some. What's the flat one? The anvil? The anvil is, to, oh, I didn't bring an anvil pair. The anvil is more to hold the branch steady and cut. And you see, if I were going to go up into this and clean it up, I would use an anvil pruner because I'm trying to get it. I don't want it to cut this way. I want it to go this way against the trunk. I don't want to open up the crotch of the branch and leave it to get rot in it. So by using the anvil to hold it in place on the bottom part, I can put my parrot in and take it off. Yeah. Little tricks you learn. <laughs> what was the spray you said to use? Dormant spray. Dormant spray. Uh, no, neem is a little bit different. Neem is an oil, and it's a naturally occurring oil. I don't know if they got licensed for it here in Canada yet, though, for neem. Oh. I'm not sure. There's a neem for insecticides, and then there's a, a neem for cleaning leaves. It's the same thing. They approved the leaf cleaner, but they didn't approve the insecticide part of it. But it does, neem oil is slightly different in that it penetrates um, and does things like flying insects because it's a finer oil, whereas dormant oil is a heavier oil and will coat scale, for instance, it coats the skin, which is what we need. Okay. So that's where you, you work from. Is that the Thank same you. As horticultural oil? Yes, horticultural oil, dormant oil, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is the time of year when I'm always checking my tools and always looking to clean them up. Unfortunately, my t tools take a fair, the pruners take a fair bit of abuse because I do Christmas arrangements. And I was cleaning out the toolbox this morning looking for pruners to bring in. I realized that we didn't clean the pine pitch off of our <laughs> tools. So I'm going to have to have a a little go and clean a lot of that because when you run your finger on it, it's yucky. Do you use mayonnaise? No. <laughs> Do you use mayonnaise? Doesn't it attract critters? Well, you wash it off. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> interesting. I. It's good for your hands. I was just going to say, it's really good for your hands. Because I know you've we've used uh, hand sanitizer wipes. Yes. I was just going to say when... I don't know why I hadn't thought of that a long time ago because COVID started and we carry around these hand sanitizers and so one day I went oh and I started using it. It's just like in my purse, the hand sanitizer in my purse comes in a little bottle like that, cleans things like you wouldn't believe. I have found so many uses that I finally went and bought a case, <laughs> you know, sorry. It works like a, it's really amazing. And I think, because I usually tell people, 
especially if you're going to work on trees or shrubs that have had a fungus or anything like that. I tell them to clean them with bleach. But hand sanitizers will do a cleaning at first but then go back at them later in the day and take it with rubbing al with alcohol. And I carry around rubbing alcohol. I've been accused of being a drunk because yeah. I've got this rubbing alcohol in my toolbox. But you know, rum works really good. <laughs> that's an expensive cleaner. Oh, it is. That's why I don't do, I don't do it very often. <laughs> anyway, it's that time of year when we're looking for things to do and it's coming up on bulb season. And I have to tell you, I was in two garden centers yesterday and I had to literally put my hands in my pockets because <laughs> some of the new tulips and daffodils and oh my God. And then I go home and I'm looking at my garden and in one part in my garden, I have a hundred bulbs planted. So where am I going to put more bulbs? <laughs> so. That's why I, I don't think a garden is ever done. No, and it's so, it, and it's true, all the different types of bulbs that are available right now, um, like how should I be storing them before I put them? Yes. In, like, and then I know some people might have bulbs from the spring that they might not have made it into the ground. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what should we do with them? As well, well, first and foremost, it's still a little, t like look what yeah. today did. It started out cool and then it went warm again. And I usually tell people, back when we were getting only 95 frost-free days or 80 frost-free days, I would tell you right now, get them in the ground. But right now I'm looking at the fact that next week they're predicting a low of three. So now I start watching for frost and cool and daffodils and tulips need a certain amount of warmth to get their roots built. So I will say probably in about two weeks, but if you're going to buy them and bring them home, please don't put them in the refrigerator. Please. In the garden center, they do just fine, but that's also, if you look where they keep them, they don't put them out in the greenhouses. They keep them in the store and near walls, not near their windows. And that's the best thing you can do. If you do feel that your house is too warm or if you don't have a spot, Use your vegetable drawer, mostly because all of our fridges now are frost free. And so that strips moisture out of your bulbs. So you're sitting there going, oh my goodness, now what? So you've got to be careful of that. And it's just like the stuff, if you didn't get it planted last spring and it needs to get in the ground, make sure it hasn't desiccated right. or dried out. And I, whenever I go through, like I was walking through spruce it up yesterday and I was checking the bulbs just to see if any of them were rotten. But I gather from talking, I bumped into a sales rep and he was, he says, Kath, why are you squeezing my bulbs? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I'm checking them to see how soft they are. He said, no, we had a perfect season. We had that really early, early rain. Then it got hot and sunny and the bulbs thrived and got nice and firm. And I have to admit, that's probably one of the things I noticed was the bulbs are nice and firm and they're good sizes this year. So if you're looking, look for that. But if you're a beginner bulb grower, one of the best things I can tell you about Calgary is don't buy the tall ones, the winds beat that mm, out of it. Get some of the shorter ones, grow some of those. And if you read the labels on the packages, it'll say, early season, mid season, late season. I tend to use mid season because the early seasons flower in April and they're not frost resistant. So they'll just, they will do okay, but they get a little bit disintegrated. So I go mid season, I try to stick around 12 to 14 inches, anything taller just, mm. although I love the peacock tulip and it has that double blossom. So I try to plant that in a sheltered corner and I get quite a good show out of it, but it needs to be sheltered. And then you just have to be patient. For instance, crocus, they don't flower in the first year. They flower in the second year. So you have to be a little patient with them. Mm -hmm. And planting them here in Calgary with our drier springs and our chinooking and no snow cover, it says on the label to plant them two inches deep 
I go three to four. And that way I get stronger stems and I get better, better management out of them. I seem to do a lot better, but it took two years for mine to establish. And now I like some of the bigger ones. So those were the ones I went for, but the little species ones do great. And when they talk about naturalizing them into lawns, it's the little species ones you want to put into the lawn. So those are things I'd look for. And right now, it's cool. They've got the fall crocus in. Have you ever tried a fall crocus? No. Well, they flower in the fall. And they're no. really, really, really strong. And also, this is the time of year when you look for the saffron crocus. Oh. It's the when you want to buy saffron and you've priced it. Yeah. Yes. Holy catfish. But periodically, the bulb growers, about every second or third year, have a spontaneous large crop of the saffron crocus. And what you're looking for is crocus septivius. And it is the one that produces the saffron. So watch for it because, and they only come in purple, but look for it because that, the saffron off of it is amazing. And even if you only plant four, you get about eight saffron threads. So just something if you're a fan of that kind of cooking. Just, yeah, just sativius, and it's purple. Activus? Sa, S-A-T-I-V-I-U-S. -I that yeah. took some thinking. Yeah. <laughs> well done, well done. Fall, um, fall flowering crocuses, you, you can you plant them right now? now for next? Well, actually, if you plant, plant them right now, you'll get flowers in October. Oh, really? Yeah, they're right, they're very cool. <laughs> and yes? I saw some at Spruce yesterday. Spruce it up? Yeah. I saw some at Garden Retreat and I even saw some at Home Depot. Yes. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I didn't make it to Home Depot, but I did see them at Garden Retreat as well. Stacy tends to buy really good specialty bulbs, so and he's Dutch. <laughs> you know? He knows this. I'm not a big bone meal fan in Calgary because of our very heavily, it's, our water is very heavy. It's very, um, it's got a high pH, so it means it has a lot of calcium in it and a lot of minerals. However, soil preparation, preparation I tend to dig the holes, prem, you know, about two weeks before I'm going to do anything in the soil. And I work in some compost. I try to find, I try to work in some fish fertilizer. I will dig and work new soil into it. And then I do fish fertilizer all through it works like a darn. And I will say that right now the pH on our water is testing around 8, 8.2. And you see by rights, tulips, daffodils like soil around seven and a half, seven. So if we use bone meal in there, cause the bone meal will add the pH. So it's just good compost and some fish fertilizer before, about a week before you plant. So that'd be better than moss going in. Oh, hundred times. Peat moss has become so manufactured now and has become very, very fine and it is also endangered. It no longer self-perpetuates. It is um, non-renewable. That's the word I was looking for. Non-renewable. And so peat moss, no. It, it, because two things, it's so refined now, it repels water and it becomes hydrophobic. So trying to work it into your soil, if you don't work it in properly and let it age, it dries your soil out. So you have to be careful of that. Compost. In the, I, I am a huge supporter of anything compost. I love the sea soil. That one is one of my favorites. And, and the thing about them is, is that they contain iron. They naturally have naturally occurring sulfur. So it makes, a really good addition to your soil. And yeah, sea soil is, I forget how much it is this year, a bag, but it's yeah. unbelievable what it does. Is it? If I could buy three or more. Ah, at Green Gate. At Green Gate? Oh, okay. Well, well society. Yeah, discount. and we get our discount on it. Right. So, right. yeah, so it is, yes. My slingshot. Uh, <laughs> no. I planted the crocuses and uh, didn't have much come up. I have terrible spots. 
soil problem. And my neighbor, that's a great gardener, he brought me this. It was a crocus bulb, and he said, I'm finding those in my <laughs> garden. Uh, good, because I'm not. <laughs> well, what you do is you play the, the squirrel game. You go out, and you do all this planting. Squirrels are dumber than a sack of hammers. So really and truly, you just have to beat them a little bit at their own game. So what I usually tell people to do is do your planting. Then they will follow what you're doing. Go into the front yard, if you were planting the backyard, go into the front yard and plant something. Pretend. <laughs> and you will, uh, you, without a word of a lie, about two hours after you go indoors, you'll see them out front trying to find what you planted. Really? Yeah, they're not, you know, they know what they want to they wanna have, but that works. And I run a trap line. So, yes. Yes. And the city comes along and fills in all the gopher holes, which drove them up into the home. Yes. Oh, and, and then they won't help, the, they say it's the homeowner's responsibility, but where I am and my neighbors in this little, we're having a heck of a time, and I actually think they're eating my, my tulip bulbs. Oh yeah, they're they're eating anything How under the ground. They get rid of them? They've even eaten a mock orange, like under the root, they're, they're eating, and we're like, no, they shouldn't have. They've forced them into whatever. Yeah. At the UFA, at Greengate, in almost every plant department or any garden center you go into right now, there is a package of three, and they're red and white. They look like sticks of dynamite. <laughs> and they literally, you throw them down the hole while well, you light them, first okay. but before you, oh yeah you light them and throw them down the hole but before you do that go and find all the holes that you can put a rock over them well no no but the, the yeah they're going to work under there but what you're going to do is throw the stick of dynamite in lit yeah. put a rock on that and that suffocates them okay. that they it smokes them out and you do that in the fall because pretty, yeah, because right now they're going to go underground for the winter. And then it's just like watching a Bugs Bunny movie or cartoon in April, May, because suddenly they reappear. And it's one morning I was having coffee on my front porch and I watched my peony just go. And I went roaring down there. I, th I just about ro fell down the stairs going over to see. And sure enough, I had gophers. And I have a great big sandstone boulder. And I realized there were a few holes around. So I went and got rocks. And I tried and I did that. And it, by God, I got rid of the little sucker. So one on each side? And like, <laughs> yeah, I, you could go so one on each side. side if you you're going to, if you read the label, it says that you can do 10 to 12 square feet underground of tunnels with one stick, but I went two sticks, cause, but my <laughs> my rock looked like a chimney. <laughs> it was just smoking. What would you do to my driveway then if I did that? Well, it'll just smoke it. It'll just, it's not fire. However, it does say very clearly on the label not to put it under a wooden porch or under the deck. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it'll smolder and it will cause your wood to burn. Okay, so, yeah, so, but those giant destroyers are worth the price of, you know. And if you get to later in the season and you can't find any, go to the UFA in Airdrie, because they've got them pretty much. The farmers, apart from using their 22s, they use giant destroyers. They're terrible. Now they're eating their, my, my neighbor's vegetable gardens, which I, I haven't, no, I've been more into perennials and shrubs, but... Yeah, well, as long as the vegetable ground garden is in ground, yeah. you can usually do that. And what I sometimes tell people is to go around with as much rock as you can put around, yeah. you know. <laughs> That's what I've done. It looks terrible, but I dig another hole. <laughs> yeah, well, no, use the giant destroyers. It works yeah. like a darn. They really... And I, I grew up on in a rural property. I'm really good with a slingshot. <laughs> I'm not allowed to shoot a gun in the city, but, and apparently my slingshot's illegal, but uh, apparently, <laughs> who knew? Oh, we have another question oh, at yes. the back. That, oh. if, you, um, if you have mold, you can give them juicy 
some. Yes. But will that work with them? No, gophers are only interested in vegetation. They won't go after gum at all. Juicy fruit gum, yes. they chew it Screaming. and it jams. Yeah. And do you, what do you do? You open the package or you... And, well, put it into the holes that you can find. Oh. But it only works on moles. It doesn't, yeah. the gopher won't go after it. Oh, oh you mean voles? Are you talking the little voles? They, they will take it sometimes, but voles don't take bait and they don't do. So voles, again, that's where you can use the giant destroyers and do them. They're about this big. They're a lot, a little Cheap. tiny mouse. Should they go inside your house? Yeah, they'll go in your house, if, but mostly they are primarily interested in your soil and they'll eat the grass. And they spend the winter between the grass and the snow layer. And with our Chinooking, they can be, they were fierce this year, fierce. Yeah, I've seen them running from like the, the yard, say, from my house to the neighbors and back. And, and I didn't, I thought they were house mice or something. Well, no. Yeah, the, yeah, you have to smoke them out or, or they don't take, um, they don't take bait. However, they do like peanut butter or cheese whiz. And you have to get it at just like the wooden traps. Yeah. You know how you put the bait close there? Well, a vole is smaller than a regular bigger mouse, the deer mice that we get. So they're somewhat bigger. So you have to set that trap and set it with the bait just beyond there and that will get them and if you go and buy mouse traps make sure you buy the double strap yeah, get a big one. don't buy the don't buy the single one well yeah no i don't believe in those sticky traps for two reasons one of the things is the birds get caught in them yeah. and i don't want to see the birds yeah, caught in yeah, no. <laughs> no, it's not going to kill a gopher. Gophers are tough little hmms. And I used to fight them in my horse paddock in it. <laughs> Giant destroyer. Hey, I mean, at the UFA, you just have to walk in and stand there and say to the cashier, where are the giant destroyers? <laughs> so just, just, you know, something to use. I saw a, a question here. Yes. Um, are the giant destroyers, I, I live just outside of city limits. Yes. And I've got everything except squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll bring some to you. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but I've got something that is about hand size with a kind of raw tail um, that I've, I've caught a couple of them with the... With a, a naked tail? Yeah. 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 And they're how big? About like that? Big hand size. Okay. Those are deer mice. Oh. oh. Yeah. And they are hard to get rid of. Yeah. They're very hard to get rid of. I've got a, an area that I would like to put a vegetable garden into and I've got packrats or something and they've gotten in there and it's very, very rough. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, can I put... Um, I was just about to say, go and get hardware, hardware wire, which is the smaller squares. The you want, yeah, the half inch even, and put line the bottom of your bed. And for the next, this fall, dig your quack grass and plant winter rye, fall rye. And fall rye puts out a really dense root system. And what it will do is it will put a really good layer on top of the soil and it will keep the weeds away and the mice will be defeated by it. Deer mice aren't real good deep diggers. I bet you if you were to dig down, you'd probably find them at this depth nesting. Yeah, but I have to, I, there's no other option about all that grass other than to dig it out. Dig it out. It. Yeah, it is. But then the fall rye will really help. Yes, I'd do it as soon as I could. And that hardware cloth or the hardware wire, it's really good, but don't buy the big one. Buy that small yeah, one because yeah. they're sneaky. <clears throat> if I've got mice as well, should I go even smaller? Yeah, I, that was just about to say, try to do the very small mesh. No, I don't have any with me, but I've been fighting a little bit of a battle, but I own a dog. 
And the yes. hard part about owning this said dog is that she's a hunter. And the other day, she didn't bring one in, she bought two in. So I'm running around the house trying to, <laughs> trying to capture mice. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, she let the cat in one day, the neighbor's cat. She was barking and growling and carrying on. And she jumped up and had a latch handle on the door and she got the door open. <laughs> and the next thing I know, she got out and the cat came in. <laughs> so, you know, it's the varmints and the critters that you can do without. And I call, I call the, um, the mice, the critters, and the varmints are, as far as I'm concerned, those blankety blank gophers. And then I, I don't know why, but I bought a house in Deer Run and didn't think about why it was called Deer Run. <laughs> So you, you know, you fight a sort of a funny little battle with yourself and you go, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> anyway, oh, question back in the, yes. Yeah, I just, I'm sorry, this is the first time I've been here. Can you just ask anything? Yes, I ask me anything. I'll try it. And if not, Laura's going to answer it. <laughs> Yes, um, as a cover crop. I, I'm wanting to know more about how you do that. How late do you w wait before you? Do well, we've probably got hard. about ten days left to get any kind of winter cover on anything. Yeah. Um, winter rye or fall rye, if you plant it, it will come up about this much. The farmers planted it because they valued it for that kind of thing. They have a root system that's aliopathic, which means they the weed systems won't grow. They won't let anything else grow. However, you've got to be really careful with winter rye or fall rye and make sure that in the springtime, before it flowers, you get it out of there or it will take over and it'll be virtually impossible to grow anything around it. The winter pea, they, they get planted in the next two or three weeks. They're fabulous. They inoculate your soil with really good nitrogen. They help with the, the development of a root a good roomy soil for it to go into and I like it I like the peas because all you do in the spring is go along and just cut the greens off of it the dead greens and leave it like that and grow grow leaf crops around it like spinach and lettuce and chard and cabbages and you'll get amazing growth because leaf crops like that nitrogen and they like what the pea does for it I also, about every three years, will put fall rye in my garden just for that. But I learned the hard way to dig it out quickly. You can't just dig it out and leave it, right? No, don't leave don't that. Take don't that. take it out. But put it in your compost bin, okay. and it helps a little bit with some of the weed seeds that grow in it. So, oh yeah, you let it grow until spring. And with our chinooking, you will look out one day, and it'll have turned green in the frosts. I mean it's just like if I've got a really bad patch of garden or I'm fighting with a back alley with weeds, I plant sunflowers. Mm -hmm. Sunflowers root systems are aliopathic as well. They don't allow anything to grow around them. So you put sunflowers in these spaces that you're fighting the weeds and you're going wow. But And clover's good but the red clover's better than the white clover. The red clover puts a better mat out and it too is a really good nitrogen inoculant. It also helps to save trace elements in your soil. But the red clover is stronger and white flowers in it, but it doesn't spit its seeds around. The white clover, on the other hand, I swear you could sit beside it and hear it go <laughs> <laughs> like a machine gun. So, you know, but those kind of cover crops, really valuable in our part of the world. This lady had a question before, Raspberries. Okay. So they are finally going to get under control. I do this every year. Yes. I'm going to basically transplant into the raspberry patch where they're supposed to be. So I know it's the second year. It's the second year. You would to produce. Over. Yes. So when I'm digging out the ones that I have, the overabundance ones, I certainly have big, tall ones that are first year growth that have no berries. That's right. And I have short ones interspersed all around. So does it matter which one of those? I'm well, you really and truly want to just move the bigger, tall ones. Okay. 
And then what will happen over the winter is part of them might dry out and die, but then they'll start to produce fruit from the lower growth and you'll continue to get that production. What kind of raspberries are they? I have no idea, but they were very abundant. <laughs> <laughs> are, I suspect there's more than one variety okay. in there. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of varieties okay. in there, but uh, very healthy. Ah. <laughs> so um, don't cut them back or anything. Just Leave the second year wood up. I'd take the short stuff right and cut it right out. And you'll probably find that by taking a fork and a shovel or a fork, when you go to like put them in between the plants and pull them apart, you will find that the second, the first year, that the stuff that produced, you will find that the root systems are out and like this because they're going to put babies up. Right. So you might want to keep one or two of them to keep the original gene pool to get them to be producing. Yes. Well, check the root system and make sure that it's putting out a spread root. Okay. Okay. If if it isn't and it's just going down, it's going to be non-productive. So you want to make sure you're getting productive root. Okay. So when I'm digging the, the clump up because it's got yeah. dead branches on it, it's got yeah. Three, you know, it's got do branches, some so do so some useful pruning. Then, Take it. Sure it's yeah. And then the, the little ones that have sprouted out. Yeah, go for the tall ones. And the ones that have sprouted up and aren't supposed to be there, maybe leave one or two to preserve your gene pool, especially if they're prolific producers. And it's just like when I see in the springtime the raspberries come in in the boxes. The first thing I want to do is turn it out of the pot and look to see how the roots are going. Yeah. I want to know that the roots are starting to reach into the... or. I usually carry around, and I don't think anybody else does this, I carry around a chopstick and I stick the stick in and you can tell how dense the roots are coming in. And that's a really good sign with raspberries. If you buy strawberries, make sure they have a good root near them. But you don't all have to carry this. There's, there's these cool sandwich ones that are shorter that hide in my pocket. <laughs> anyway, Sharon, you had a question. Yeah, it's winter called a winter pea. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I I've bought them from Father Gills and from West Coast Seeds, both of them. Uh, and you're not expecting anything to come across. All I'm getting is leaves and I won't get any you might get the odd pea right. and, and that's fine. But what I'm looking for is soil nutrition. I'm looking for building my soil. My grandpa used to do that and I used to question him. I'm I'm um an old Albertan. I probably fourth or fifth, you know, I'm fifth generation. And my grandpa used to take me on the bus downtown Edmonton and we would go to Pike's Seeds and the seeds were in big barrels and he would look for the peas to come in. And the guy that owned Pike's Seed was just a here hilarious because he'd see he'd see grandpa coming and go, Archie, here. Because <laughs> my grandpa but I think grandpa just liked to walk around and when you're five and six years old and you're walking around, it was an adventure. It's like when you used to fish, buy your seed potatoes, and they were in a great big barrel, and you just picked your own and put them in a bag. Grandpa was really good at that. And as I got older, I used to say, Grandpa, could you go get me some pea some potatoes? And he would. Yes? Um, I have a, a, the person who gave it to me called it a fall aster. Yes. Uh, can I move it now in the fall? It's flowering, isn't it? It's no, you want to wait until it finishes flowering. Personally, I'd rather see you move it in the spring. In the spring, okay. Yeah. I like the, the fall aster, the English call them Michaelmas daisies. Oh. And I love that. I, I think they're amazing. The first time I ever saw one really producing was in my garden in England. And I was going, oh. But I mean, I bought that house for the fact that it had two of the biggest hydrangeas I'd ever seen. Mm. So <laughs> my husband said, what'd you do today? Well, I bought a house. <laughs> Don't I get to see it? I has two of the most amazing hydrangeas you've ever seen. <laughs> Kid from the prairie. Oh, it was ridiculous. Anyway, yes. I want to grow some garlic for the first time. Okay. Information, please. Okay. <laughs> Are you going to come to the plant share on Saturday? Because we're doing the great garlic, garlic exchange, exchange and we'll have garlic. 
don't plant the whole bulb. You only plant one clove. You want to plant them at least five to six inches deep. And you don't want to plant them until about the first week in October. When the soil's cold, they don't like hot soil. And our soil is still really warm. My compost thermometer told me, even though it was cool this morning, my compost thermometer told me my vegetable garden temperature was at 72 degrees. So that's still warm. There's still, the, there's still a lot of heat in the ground. So that's what you want to do. You want to make it that and space them at least six inches, six inches apart because you want bigger bulbs. We planted some at Atco. That was have got to be the biggest garlic I've seen in I can't tell you how long. But the trick with the, oh, the garlic's in the, in the house. Oh, <laughs> but you want to take the full bulb and instead of pulling it apart with your hands, you literally take it and smack it on the flat side down, like the root will come here, and you just want to do a real firm smack, and it will split apart naturally. And then you just pull the cloves off and plant them. Don't disturb the fabric of it. Don't disturb the cover. You want to just get them in, point and side up. And then they'll start to sprout in mid-April, mm -hmm. April, May, and then you start watching them. And then, sorry? Hard. I prefer hard neck. Soft neck it isn't as strong growing here and right now the garden centers are selling an elephant garlic it's very soft necked so if i were going to plant those cloves i'd go down seven or eight inches so that they get a good support on their trunk and they will produce good cloves but the hard neck's the best music um russian red russian red german the white. yeah the german white is another one of my favorites so do yeah german white and the thing is that all of them, just like peppers, have a different heat intensity. Mm -hmm. So music is not really, really hot, but it's delicious. And then that thing produces a flower, the skate. a skate, yeah. and it is delicious. Right. All of them, all the of them go neck. to flower. The yes. hard neck garlic produces skate. And that flower and that stem has the most delicious, luscious garlic flavor to it. And it is also, when you buy garlic powder in the store, that's what they're making garlic powder for, from. And oh. I've been working quite a bit with the Blue Flame Kitchen, and they grew garlic again this year. And they grew Russian red. And oh my goodness, those were the biggest cloves I've seen. But they made garlic powder from their, their Scapes. scapes. <laughs> And you get it just as they start to open, because if they go to seed, they don't make as big a bulb. So that's the thing. And then you harvest them mid-August. Just, just, just regular watering, soil prepping, the way I talked about, and you'll get, you'll get an amazing group of plants. Yes, Deb? Do you put a mulch on your garlic bed? I was just about to say, but the biggest trick in Calgary because of the Chinooks is mulch. And I personally like leaf mulch. I'll be that strange person in your back alley taking all the clear garbage bags with mulch, leaves. with yeah. leaves. Yeah. I really liked it when the city had the depots. I'd just go in and go, <laughs> nope, not that one. Oh, I'm going to have that one. And it, But leaf mulch works like a darn. Make sure it's well watered and it will help. I mean, Sharon, how many years did we grow garlic at the old office? Five? Yeah. And we produced a lot of garlic out of there. No, you replant it, but you get, because you're going to grow all those cloves, you, the whole three or four back, you get eight bulbs, ten bulbs out of there, and, yeah, and once you get it going, and the hard neck garlic is, to me, it's part of our heritage. These are all garlics that have come over with people from the old country, and they've grown it that way, and oh, I couldn't figure out why my grandpa's garlic always tasted so good, so... Um, it, it's one of those crops, but that's one of the fall crops that I don't want to ever miss out on. So I've already got it already figured out. I have celery growing where my garlic's going to go this year, so <laughs> I haven't figured. <laughs> Can you grow it in part, part sun? Yeah, I've grown mine in part sun and it grows just as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, same. Yes. Yeah, it's supposed to be very chickweed. <laughs> yes. It's delicious. Would leaf mulch help? Yes, it would deter it because chickweed has a seed, a flower head, and then a seed head, and it, 
it will sit in hot sun and just produce seeds like a machine gun. It'll just go and, and it'll grow. Then the root system becomes a heavy mat. But if you deprive it of light and cover it in leaf mulch, you eliminate good percentage of it. One of my old profs used to say, to remember the Latin name, just think of that movie and go, Stella! Huh? Its Latin name is Stellaria Medina. <laughs> so, it's kind of one of those memory tricks I teach myself. So, yes? How about allium bulbs? Same advice as the Same advice tulips? as the tulips, get them in. Yeah, the smaller ones go down just a bit, but the great big ones, get them down at least eight inches because those great, the Christophii, the big, huge one like this, it goes down at least eight inches, and it, they're amazing alliums. And is that same sea soil? Again? Same things. The, the depth is because of the stability? Yes, the stability and the fact that you don't want them coming up too fast. So that is the trick with Calgary, because we get into April and we start having that warming, yeah, yeah. and then all of a sudden our soil temperatures change. But then we get our famous May 20 long weekend, we get the eight feet of snow. So we've, we've got to be a little careful, and the younger bulbs, you know, they'll be about this high in the snow, but they'll, they'll do well. I, no, I just, with alliums, I just let them go. I just let them go. So. Can I ask you an allium story question? Um, I've, ta I've had allium for years and they're beautiful. I love them, but I've never done anything to them. <laughs> but they are starting to get a little thinner now. They're not as abundant. And yes. So what do I do? With well, it's fall. You could start lifting so and getting right in there. and But go in not with a fork. Go in with a shovel and go down beside the bigger clumps and lift it and then take your fork and loosen them. Just loosen them up? Yeah, loosen them and pull them apart. And you will find they look just like garlic cloves except that the older bulb will still be in the middle and then there will be extra bulbs mounted around it. And then just start peeling them back and planting the individual bulbs. And they're tighter than garlic so they'll stay quite tight together but you want to eliminate the ones that are growing around the bulb oh, like that. Okay. And then probably what you're also getting is they go to seed yeah. and you've got babies everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well then you don't have that problem. For those of you who have that problem, cut the seed heads off or they will just keep producing and producing. I really like my big alliums because they don't produce as much of a seed. But the smaller alliums, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. My next door neighbor came over and got some of those. I didn't seed from mine. Yes. She's planning, I didn't know, but she's planning on growing them from seed. Sure. Easy. Yeah, I grow some of my garlic from seed. Every once in a while, I get really brave and spread some of the seed around from when I forget to take off the scapes. I'll miss one or two. So I'll take them off. We're having a fall fair yeah, I saw that. Golden at Golden yeah, Acre, I'm and I'm actually going to take and show you how I take apart a part of garlic, and I'll show you what the ones that grew from seed, okay. and I'll ha I have the one I have one that's second generation, and I forgot to take the head off, but it made two cloves, but it didn't make a big enough bulb to suit me, so I will take the two cloves and plant them again. But it takes it about two years from seed to start producing, okay. and, and they do really well. They do very well. Can you plant again, plant well? I, no, we, we tried them in the raised beds at the old office, and we did not do well with them. They need lots of insulation on the root, and they, then they do much better. Plus, they need moisture retention, and a planter in the fall and winter loses nice. moisture. Yes. Pruning um, hmm, cher cherries uh, this time of year or in the spring? Well, they've spent all Schubert, of this. Schubert, Schubert, Schubert cherry? Schubert, Schubert. Oh, you could take it now yeah. and it won't hurt it at all. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anything that produces fruit and is gone and you've harvested it, don't be in a hurry to prune it. Prune it in March, April, and then clean it up. And remember that they will have produced over this season, 
when they're growing, they will produce little leaflets sitting like this along the trunk and along the stems, and that's where the buds are going to come from. Oh, sure. Lawnmower. Right there, and the, and the fact that it's changing this one. Yeah. That is the natural bark, and that's what certain apples and certain chair. Yeah, this is an ornamental. Is nothing to worry about? No, it's oh, just okay. its natural bark texture. Oh, okay, <laughs> <Nice>. Yes. <laughs> I've got my usual. Oh, you got a bag full of stuff. Yes. Um, so, when it when the leaves go like that, so they're a little bit. Looking for it. This, they, some of them are reddish, but some of them are the yellow, and then they turn brown yes. and that kind of yeah. stuff on them. And it doesn't really matter. I I have a combination of stuff I've overwintered that I bought and that, that are seedlings, or like our cuttings, and they're all doing a very similar thing. How often are you watering? Um. They're on the deck, so they're in a direct sun. So one or two times, like sorry, every other day or every day, depending on how it, geraniums. It is is it? Yes, okay. <laughs> this okay. is what they call edema, and it's overabundance okay. of water. Okay. And and you got to remember, geraniums are Mediterranean in yes. origin. Okay. They grew up. The original seed stock came out of the Mediterranean, which is very dry. But this is literally edema, and then it turns into what they call corky edema. It goes all corky all the way right. around. Okay, so even though they appear to They be, appear to be, just, yeah, right. they're getting too, they need to dry out. Well, and unfortunately, some of them are with petunias that need water. Yeah, so it's, like, yeah. it's a question okay. of fighting it. Okay. So you and water then, the outer edge of the pot, not the well, inner edge. That's what I've tried to do. So this, I brought something like this in a couple of times ago, and then the idea, was, the thought was that there were thrips there. The, 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 the planter is now, it's gotten bigger, it's flowering, all this kind of stuff, but the leaves are, have all of this yeah. stuff on them. That's the egg casings from your thrips. Okay, so that's what it is. Yeah, so you got to clean it up. So how do I get that? Because I can't find anything with a label that says takes care of thrips on it. Well, there, that's because thrips are really hard to get rid okay. of. And and the so only thing that, yeah, and, and they are thrips. These are the egg casings. Okay, yep. yep. I'll pass it around if you want to look at them. Yes, thrips okay. are a really tiny, yeah. tiny, tiny little fly. They primarily do a lot of damage to flowers. But what you will find is that they will build up and they will start to lay eggs. They're getting ready for winter. Oh, so yeah. that's the problem. Okay, is so even though it's been healthy. Yeah. So um, really and then next spring, are you going to overwinter them? Well, I don't know that I want to because no. this is from last I was year about to say, no, you don't want to, no. I was going to suggest your much. compost bin for them. Okay. Mm. I hate they to be like that. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. Are they the tiny? A, the tiny slug? That's not your mulch. That came in on something. It came in on a plant or it came in on that. And this was a really bad year for the juvenile slug in that we didn't put... Every winter, every fall, before I put my garden to bed, I put these in my blender. These are eggshells. And I do a little surfacing of my areas. And if I have a rock garden or somewhere around the edge of my garden, I will lift rocks and throw some in because they lay their eggs under protection. So what you were seeing was the juveniles because we had that amazing rain and it literally made them go into mating frenzy and then they laid extra eggs this year. So if they're... Yeah, so do a little little eggshell saving and go out and do it. I mean, I only crush mine that much, but I've also been known to go back to the blender and put more. Anyway, today is the last conversations in the garden because obviously the weather will change next month. But we now go to tea, tea for two. And I mean, I bought this. This is my mom's tea kettle and it was her grandma's. And we used to, as kids, use it as a weapon. <laughs> so it's taken a few bashing. But this this coming September, October, we will move to the indoors and we will do tea for two. 
and I try to invite guests in the gardening industry who will sit and tell you all sorts of neat stories and you can we answer lots of questions online and it's always fun so maybe and who knows maybe we'll get brave and have one a tea party indoors before we move before we move outside I have a fancy tea party anyway um, I hope to see some of you at the plant chair. I hope to see some of you at the fall fair. And with all the upcoming things, we'll see. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. See you next time.